to the word while you're standing judges chapter 6 verse 12 judges chapter 6 verse 12 the angel of the lord appeared to him and said i might have church by myself mighty hero the lord is with you can you just say to yourself say self, self. God, god didn't bring me, didn't bring me. This, far this far just to bring me this far my family my future my destiny i'm fighting for it this means war praise them like you believe it then i want you to have a seat so I, i've been tripping i've been tripping over this thought that what if the thing god has for you is for you it's just requiring you to fight for it I'm going to say it again. What if the thing that God has for you is for you, it's just requiring you to fight for it? Well, Pastor Mike, I heard a song growing up that literally said, what God has for me. You got to be Baptist to know that. And I'm going to say it again. In 70, y'all better know what I'm saying. What God has for me, it is for me. Did that not tear up 100 women in hats? What God has for me. Somebody lead it. It is for me. I'm going to see if you know the verse. I'm going to see if you know. I know. Say. I know without a doubt. What is God going to do? That he will bring. So what's your declaration? What God has for me. It is. Can I suggest to you that as good as that sounds, you might have to fight for it. You might have to fight for it. Pastor Mike, I've been in church a long time and I've discovered if it's mine, I won't have to fight. You better ask the children of Israel who get to the promised land and they discover that there are giants in the land. And he sends over 12 spies. Ten of them say we can't do it, but two of them had to be from Rock City because they said, if it's for me. It's on and popping. See, because in this season of my life, I've done an inventory of my life and I've discovered there were too many things that was right at my reach that I didn't fight for. And what I'm discovering is if we're going to find a new normal, if we're going to be what God is calling us to be, God is saying, Michael, you're going to have to fight for it. All right. I said it once and I said it again, put it in your notes if you don't remember it. Whoever God favors. The kingdom features, but the devil fights. Hear me when I say this. One of the coldest things I said last week that I think many of you miss is that if you don't run into the devil, it may be because you're running with the devil. Can I help somebody in here tonight? And God told me to tell you the same way Uncle Sam said it 50 years ago. I need you. I was tripping the other day watching a series on Netflix entitled You. Netflix entitled You. Uh, this brother reminded me so much of myself, honestly, uh, and a whole lot of people at this church. No, he he was overly uh, obsessed. This brother, he loved for real. That was good love to me. Now, that was a good relationship. Some of y'all laughing. That's the type of love you need in your life right there. If you love me, follow me in Jesus' name. If it's real, stalk me. If you ain't got a burner page looking at my story, if you love me, check my stories, then check who else like my story and look at my story. No, that's love. Jesus went to Calvary to save a wreck like Lou, you and me. No, I need you to stand in the bushes to make sure I go to bed at night. No, seriously, folk, or should I say, but spiritually, folk, I saw something in that story that just blessed me. This brother will become overly... Um, obsessed with something he fell in love with and I began to think about God and how I feel like God is wanting you how overly obsessed he is with your destiny think about it he loves you so much that when you run from him he follows you he loves you so much that when you fall he picks you up he loves you so much that when you didn't want him he I'm talking to seven of y'all if you receive it. He, he stalks me in such a way that even when I find myself in places that I shouldn't be, he, he see, I'm only talking to three of y'all who have been in some mess and the mess could have been a whole lot worse, but God was making a way to get in it with you. 
That's why the songwriter said he didn't see fit to let none of the, he is overly obsessed with me. That, that's, that's what we call in the Greek agape. It is this love that goes beyond because people love you based off of their preference. People will love you based off of how you make them feel. But God says, as dirty as you are, the text says your best is like a filthy rag. He said, Mike, I love the messed up you. And, and I begin to think about that, that if God loves me that much, what shall I give back to him? And I was tripping because when I began to find the perfect picture of an obsessed love for my destiny, that's critical, an obsessed love for my destiny, I was led to a brother by the name of Gideon. Now, Gideon is cold-blooded, and please put this in your notes, because names denote destiny. Jesus. Names denote destiny. Destiny. What does that mean? Biblically, they only gave names based off of prayer, prophecy, or preparation. <sighs> prayer, prophecy, preparation. They didn't just wake up and say Alizé. They didn't just wake up and say, well, the other one was Michael, so I'm going to name this Micah. No, every name was prayed over because it denoted a type of destiny. This is why you got to be careful what people call you. Call them boo, they may scare you. Call them baby, they may never grow up. Because names mean something. Hear me when I say this. So he calls this brother Gideon. Now, this is not in the screen, so I need you to write this. Gideon translates to mean he who cuts down. Jesus. He who cuts down. All right. He who cuts down. So when we find Gideon, before we tiptoe into the corridors of Judges chapter six, we have to uh, peruse back to Judges chapter five because a text without context becomes a pretext. OK, so I, I, I find it somewhat incredible that Judges chapter five ends with verse 30 saying the land was quiet for 40 years. But then Judges chapter six, verse one starts with yet again, the people of Israel went back to doing evil. You missed it. Chapter five ends by saying there was peace. Chapter six starts by saying, but they got problems. So I'm tripping because if chapter five ended with God giving me 40 years of no torture, 40 years of no problems, 40 years of no debt, 40 years of no enemies, 40 years of promises. How do I end up in chapter 6, verse 1, with the statement saying, yet again, the people of Israel are back doing evil. Why, PMJ? Please put this in your notes. Because I've discovered that the children of Israel are proof that peace can be a problem. <clears throat> yeah. They are proof that peace can be a problem. You want to know what I discovered, Rock City? Peace is problematic for people who are not in purpose. Mm, give me a little more Jay peace is problematic for people who are not in purpose if you give a person peace who does not have an assignment they'll find a way to kill themselves Michael look at somebody around you and say please get in purpose because the peace you paying for may praying for may kill you because peace is problematic. Why? It was A.W. Tozer who said in a beautiful book that I would challenge all of you to read entitled The Pursuit of God. He said complacency is a deadly foe of all spiritual growth. Complacency is a deadly foe of all spiritual growth. Can I contemporize, modernize, and mcleurize it? In other words, if I give you too much peace, it may stunt you. I got a tree in my backyard right now that they told me there's nothing I can do for it. It's going to die. So they said, Pastor Mike, this is what we can do. We can cut it down now and go ahead and plant something. He said, but in, in a couple years, it's either going to fall or we're going to have to come cut it. I said, what's the problem? He said, well, the way your irrigation system is set up, everything in your house flow on your yard flows down. He said, so this last tree got too much water. I said, whoa. I, I said, no, you're supposed to water your plants. He said, yeah, but you can still drown it. Yeah. Too much of anything is a problem. Yeah. Michael, and I want to argue with you that many of you, the reason I have you assembled before we get into 2022, because for many of us, the greatest fight we're going to have to fight is peace. Because I want to argue that there are some signs that peace is problematic. 
If I'm stepping on your toes, help me real quick. Because one sign that peace is problematic is when you only pray when you have a problem. <laughs> see, see, peace is problematic for me when the only time I pray is when I'm in need or got a problem. Peace is problematic for me when my worship is centered around my wounds. That's heavy. Peace is problematic for me when my worship is centered around my wounds. Let me make that make sense, okay? This is what I love so much. The Bible says the children of Israel were in bondage, then they cried out. And then what did God do? Got them out of it. Then another time, the children of Israel in bondage, and they cried out. And what did God do? Got them out of it. Then another time, the children of Israel are in bondage. And what did they do? Cried out. And God did what? Came and got them. Can I ask you a question? Why is it the only time we really see them worship is when they're in bondage? It's because when you don't understand purpose, you abuse peace. This is for six of y'all that when it ain't no problems, you'll create one. I need God to deliver six of y'all and you don't have to say amen. Well, you might need to say, hey, welcome to an AU meeting or, or a peace AU meeting, whatever we're going to call it. Because for some of you, when stuff get too good, you start automatically thinking something got to be wrong with this. You are a serial fighter. If you don't have a fight to fight, you'll make one. So, so peace is problematic for me when my worship is centered around my wounds. Make that make sense, PMJ. When the only time you can really give God glory is when you wound it. See, peace is a problem for you if the only time worship gets good to you is when you weak. Problematic. Peace is a problem for you when the motive of your giving is gain. I'm giving because I know it's coming back good measure. Yes, it is. But please don't tell me the only reason you're giving is because Jesus is your new crypto. And what I'm trying to get you to realize is there is a cycle. Help me, Pastor Mike, that we have to break. Please write this in your notes. It is a cycle called rebellion, retribution, repentance, restoration. This is the cycle that since the children of Israel has not been broken and we still live it out right now. We rebel. We do what God tells us not to do. Then there's retribution. He whoops us. Then we repent. Then he restores. I hope you see what I'm going to tell you right here. So you rebel in 05. He ended up whooping you all 06 and 07. You repent in 08. He bring it all back in 09. So you shout about 09. Oh my God. Oh my God. See, one of the greatest things we abused in the church is testimony service. See, because when you are spiritually immature, you glamorize the prize and overlook the journey. So we do stuff like praise the Lord, saints. Praise the Lord, saints. First giving honor to God, who's the head of my life, to the pastor, saints, and friends. I am so glad and so blessed to be here. I just want to tell y'all that I didn't have a clue how these last three years have took me down through there. But this year, and as soon as you say this year, because you're a recovering problem maker, your spirit says, here it comes, because we're looking for the shout. This year, everything I lost. Everything I lost, he brought it back. And the whole church take out running. When I'm sitting there saying, now that's been your testimony for seven years. So can I ask you a question? If it took, if it took four years for you to get back what you never should have lost, what could you really got? Okay, okay, I I'm finna free you, I'm finna free you, okay? So let's just say, let's just say God starts you here, okay? Then he says, my goal is for you to go there, okay? And then all of a sudden, you start living right and you start doing right. Then you rebel. Okay, then you rebel. Hmm. Then you rebel. Hmm. Then you rebel. And the problem with rebellion is it looks like progress. The problem with rebellion is that it feels like you're winning. See, you don't know you losing until you've lost. I don't think you heard what I just said right there. You don't know you're losing until you've lost. Because when you're in rebellion, 
rebel young. You are in a place where you are doing what you desire to do. And what the devil will do is allow you to get too far out there. It's called liminal. Liminal. It's called liminal. See, because our because we are uneducated believers, we live life. We live life based off of the language that we have. So you but you've only heard limited limited means it may not be surplus, but you got something. There's another word we have to adopt called liminal liminal means that I've gotten too far to go back, but where I'm going is not yet ready. And what the devil does is he allows you to get out there so far that if you went back, it would be toxic. And what happens is that many of us don't realize that the devil was setting you up. He was setting you up because he gave you something that you thought was a blessing, but your one in purpose called peace. He gave you somebody who brought you just enough smiles that you thought the smile was joy. He gave you just a job that gave you what looked like just enough money until you really broke it down and realized where you were was better than where you are. See, the devil is tricky. Yeah, this is why he let Judas, this is why God created Judah, but he used Judas. Because he says, if I can make something look close enough to what God did, if they not focus, they'll mistake it. Now, God says Judah means praise. Judas is the betrayer. And if you're not careful, you praise something too much, you'll turn your back on God. Judah do this. He does these sneaky things. He, he, he does things to kind of take you out and in of out of his presence. And what I'm here to submit to you right now is for many of us, if we aren't careful, we're going to find ourselves in a Judges chapter five and Judges chapter six season where God is starting to answer your prayers. Yet you went back. I'm preaching to somebody if you're receiving tonight. See, that's for Father, y'all, who can be honest enough to say, Pastor Mike, I'm grateful. I might run by myself that God didn't give me everything I prayed for. Can I preach to three people who are truth be told, had God gave you what you prayed for three years ago, ain't no telling where you would be right now because you wanted it, but you weren't prepared for it. But God knew what was best for you. Complacency is a deadly foe to our spiritual growth. And the cycle that we have to break is rebellion, rep retribution, repentance, and restoration. The children of Israel are back doing evil in the sight of God. He turns them over to bondage. But in verses 11 and 12, it says, One day the angel of God came and sat down under the oak at Oprah, then belonged to Joash, the Abzerite, whose son Gideon was threshing wheat in the wine press. Now, I need y'all to really look at this scripture. So it's my job as your pastor to take the same story and every time I preach it, lift the different principle that you have missed or probably did not pay attention to. This one scripture presented me with something that I had not seen in all my years of preaching. Here it is. I was so ready to get to the part where he said, as oh, mighty warrior. But then the Holy Spirit said, Mike, open your eyes. Look at what the scripture says. Gideon was threshing wheat in the wine press. Why is that important, PMJ? He threshed wheat at the wine press. The wine press was at the bottom of the hill so you could carry the grapes downhill. The wheat threshing took place at the top of the hill so the wind would drive away the chaff. Okay, you, you got to catch this, okay? So the wine press is at the bottom. The wheat thresh is at the top. Okay, I need you to really see this so you can catch this point. So you would take the wheat to the top. You would grind your grapes at the bottom. But when we find Gideon, he's doing the work of the top. At the bottom. So what is a wheat thresh? Here's what a wheat thresh is. You remember when the Bible said, I'm going to separate the wheat. From the terry. The chaff is the excess. So what they would do was carry the wheat all the way to the top of the hill. They would then run over it with an oxen. As the oxen stomped over it, all of it would go into the air. Help me, Holy Ghost. And what would happen was the wind would blow the chaff but drop the seed. 
I'm going to say it again. It would be so much that the wind would blow away what was unnecessary. But what was critical was so weighted. It would just remain. See, this is for five of y'all that when people see you next year and they ask, what happened to so-and-so? The wind caught him. Jesus. I don't know who I'm preaching to. Many of y'all can't even explain. This is for 10 of y'all who can't even explain why y'all don't talk no more, why they don't come around no more. All you remember is one day we was cool, then the next day two months passed by. Look around you and say, the wind caught him. I am in the season of my life where God blow everything away that is not like you. I wish I had a worshiper who would say, God, not a promotion, not a house. Because if I get a house with some of the same people, they're going to have me put out of that one. I need you to blow. Jay, the wind caught him. The wind caught him. The wind caught him. That's why this year I'm giving you permission. Have a meeting with everybody you love. Send a voice memo to everybody you love. Hey, this is me. Just giving you a call. Let you know I love you. And I certainly thank God for all that he's doing in your life. But this year I'm on assignment. I'm on a mission. Pause. That should have told the whole church. I'm on a mission. It's some stuff I got to get this year. It's some blessings I got to get this year. There's some doors I am not missing this year. There's another level of anointing, another level of favor, another level of purpose, and I cannot waste time this year trying to convince you that I am who I am and you are who you are. So I'm making it very clear. Come January 1, if the wind start blowing, you better be heavy enough to handle the wind. Cause I am done chasing stuff that God blew. Somebody shall blow. Let the wind. So this is critical, Jay. This is critical. So so they, he would. So I want to paint the picture. He would have to carry it all the way ooh, up the hill. Get it on the hill. Then the wind would do the work. But the problem I see in the text is Gideon is doing at the bottom what he should have been doing. Okay, can, can, we think, can we think critically? This is such a loaded statement right here because two things are happening in this text, okay? Why? You have to ask yourself why. Why is Gideon hiding? He's hiding because the Midianites have ravaged his nation. There is nothing Left. Imagine if I were, if, if Birmingham was, imagine if Alabama was invaded by Georgia. And in Georgia, we all know based off of what happened uh, in the SC championship, that that would never happen. We know it, it just hits differently. And that, that was a bad example. Let me flip it. Imagine if Georgia was invaded by Alabama. Okay. And when we get to Georgia, everything that's valuable, we take. I want to paint this picture. I'm going to show you what God will do. Are you listening to me? I want to show you what God would do. I'm sorry. I want to show you what God will do when he gives you peace and you choose problems. He says, this is what I'm going to do. I'm not just, oh my God. Thank you, God. I'm not just going to make you have a famine. Mm -mm, That's too easy. Because if I let a famine come, you'll miss the lesson thinking it was the land's fault. Because who I let whoop you trains you. No, so if I make it a famine, you would think, well, the reason I'm hungry is because we in a bad spot. He says, no, no. I'm going to send a prophet to let you know I'm giving you over. And here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to let you work all year to produce it. Then let folk come take it. So imagine every, every spring you would go outside. Okay, y'all ain't farmers. Let me make it make sense. Every first of the month, your overcount overflow. Okay? And you look at your, you wake up, look at your online banking and say, look at God. Go to the restroom, come back, and it's zero. With a note that says, cousin them. And you're like, God, why are you, you not, you, you, you not going to say nothing. And God is like, you pick that. So Gideon, are y'all still with me? Gideon can no longer 
do his wheat pressing at the hill. Because if he does it at the hill, his enemies see it. So he has to hide at the bottom. Now, maturity has me preaching on a different level that I view things from a different lens. So this is why, this is why I love that I was raised Baptist because I feel like there's no better preacher than a Baptist preacher the way he investigates the text. But why I spent a year going to Yale Divinity? Because I wanted to see sometimes the science behind what you would see. And what I've discovered is this presents me with um, a duality in my, and, 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 and my a duality in my perspective. Because either Gideon is weak or he's wise. Sorry, he's weak because if you really want the wheat, why are you scared? See, I'm going to free some of y'all. Some of y'all fighting fights that you did never had to fight. Not because you bad, because you prideful. So, so I want to paint the picture. I can't believe Gideon hiding at the bottom of the hill. You a man just like he a man. Go to the top of that hill and deal with your wheat. Yep. Only problem is it's Gideon. And it's the Mennonites. Y'all missed it. It's him and them. So am I supposed to be a G trying to fight them? So I'm supposed to get jumped. Even though the man on Instagram told me if I just go in a circular motion and keep doing this right here, they won't beat me up. But that ain't going to work when you're really getting jumped. So many of y'all would say, I ain't running from nobody. Can I free you? Sometime God anoints you to run. I'm going to see where my scholars at. Who challenged all the prophets on the hill and called the drought? Elijah. Who? Elijah. Who? Elijah. What did he do after he prophesied a drought? God said, run. I'm God enough to kill all of them. But if I kill them, they miss the punishment. I need them alive and miserable. That's for 70 of y'all who keep kicking people out your life. You ain't got to kick them out. Just allow them to view. I'm not weak. So, so, so many of us will say he's weak. I can't believe he's hiding. All them girls did to you and you ain't going to say nothing. Why are you hiding? I'm not weak. I'm wise. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking this through. If don't nobody have nothing. And the fact that he's um, pressing this wheat by hand. Let's us know he don't have a lot because if he had the portion that he normally has, he would need an oxen. So the fact that he's counting it by hand lets me know he only has a little bit. So this brother says, you know what? I'm going to take the little bit I got. I'm going to find a spot where ain't nobody at and I'm going to manage my misery. I'm going to say this and I pray five of y'all can receive this. Okay. You are in a season of your life where sometimes God is not. See, God is not concerned with pulling you out of it if he's pulling something out of you. I, no, I messed that up. I got to say it better. I, I won't be able to sleep at night. God is not concerned with bringing you out of it if he realizes it can bring it out of you. And many of y'all are praying, God, take me out of it. And God is like, no, manage it. Can I free you? Can I free you? Can I free you? Can I free you? All right, I need, I need your help. I'm going to say a name. I want you to tell me what they did, why you know their name, okay? Daniel. Shadrach, Meshach, Bendigo. Lazarus. Why do you know them? Because he didn't take them out of it. If Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego would have been at the door of the furnace and God said, no, you would have never remembered them. But he had to put them in it. If Daniel would have been at the gate of the, of the mouth of that cave and God said, I'm going to block it, you never would have remembered them. What if the thing you're going through is the thing you're going through? Because God said, if I take you out of it, you won't. Your value it's sometimes determined not just by what you don't go through, but by what you do go through, okay? Let me make that very practical. Let me make that very practical, okay? Very practical, okay? If you got a million dollars and no bills, that's bad in a sense. Why, Pastor Mike? Because you have no credit history. 
I'll never forget when I went to get my first car. They said, we can't do nothing with you. I said, why? You've never had a bill. I said, that's a good thing, right? They said, no, I need to see you go through something. I need to see how you handle responsibility. This is why when your credits go jumped, you got so excited because you watched it come back. I, I, I got to stop. I'm, I'm going to have church by myself. So he's wise, but I need you to catch this. Why? Because it is while hiding. Now, somebody say hiding. hiding. Am I doing all right? Yeah. Somebody say hiding. hiding. He's hiding. But the text says in verse 12, the angel of the Lord appeared to him. Oh, my God. This is cold blooded because I saw something I ain't never seen before. <laughs> you want to know what your boy saw in this text? Do you want to know what I saw in a text? His enemies can't find him, but God does. I'm going to say this, okay? I'm going to pause. I'm, I'm going to come to this side, okay? Because aren't you glad that when you was hiding from them, you still couldn't hide from him? That's why grandmama would say, when I realized it, the eyes of the Lord are in all places and if he have to reach way down he'll do whatever he got to do to pick you so while Gideon I want to pay attention while Gideon is tripping Gideon pressing <laughs> angel of the Lord rose up on rose up on him and says mighty hero the Lord is with you now this is what scholars my college scholars call a theophany you can put that in your notes theophany spell it the best way you can the <laughs> Now, the rest of the church watching right now, so do me a favor. Put your head down like you're writing so they don't think we all slow, okay? So just act like, I'm going to say it again. I need all y'all to say, mm, okay? Let's do it again, okay? So what y'all going to say? Okay, ready? All right, hold on. This is what my scholars call a theophany. Yeah, what, what is a theophany, Pastor Mike, okay? Theophany or a theophanic experience. It is a divine appearance. A divine appearance. The angel of the Lord. A theophanic experience, okay? But some scholars argue, try not to run. This is a Christophany. Okay, so, so what is a theophany? It is God on earth in a divine way. A Christophany is Jesus pre-incarnate. Okay, Pastor Mike, there can't be no Christophany. Remember when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were in the fiery furnace? And he said, I threw in three, but it looks like I see four. But Jesus appears before he ever shows up. That's called a Christophany. Most scholars believe that the angel of the Lord in this text is not a regular angel. It is either God himself or Jesus, which gives me a principle. Here's a principle that I can take and make applicable to my life is that when I am in purpose and God says so, he won't send help. He is my help. Y'all caught that. Okay, I'm going to say it again. He won't send help. He is my help. Make that make. There's a difference in you sending somebody and you showing up yourself. God sent me here to prophesy that over the next 21 days, he's getting ready to show up in your situation. You ought to shout like he's getting ready to show up. I'll show up. McKinley, yes daddy. Go tell the boys I said stop. Daddy said stop. Miles. Go tell the boys daddy said die. Boys, daddy said stop. Yes, God. Oh, yeah. And it's something about your kids that they know what your steps sound like. Yeah. That's for seven of y'all that you know what his steps sound like. Yeah. And while you walking, you can hear them scratch. Stop, stop, stop. Here come mama. Y'all stop, y'all stop, y'all stop. Then once you get down there, then I tell you. Now, here's the problem. Here's the problem. You told them, but who you sent didn't carry weight. 
God told me to tell you, I could have sent you a prophetic word, but you so rebellious right now, you would have looked down on who I would have sent to bring it because you ain't who you thought was going to show up. So God said over the next 21 days, you may turn on the radio and hear my voice. You may hear a commercial and hear my voice. I'm going to find a way to get a word to you. Jesus is my help. It is a theophany or a Christophany. So watch this. Watch, this is cold-blooded, Bravis. This is cold-blooded, okay? Cold-blooded, cold-blooded, okay? All right, all right. Hollis, Pastor Hollis, okay? His entire life, he's been called Jeremy. Did you know that? Jeremy. Some of y'all looking at me like, what? No. Throughout middle school, Jeremy. Elementary school, Jeremy. High school, Jeremy. College, Jeremy. Adulthood, Jeremy. He comes to the church. Holy Spirit gives me a prophetic word over his life. And I said, I don't know why, but the Holy Spirit told me, we're going to go by your other name. His name is Hollis Jeremy Thomas. But he went by Jeremy. I said, the Lord told me from this day forward, I'll never call, you shall be called Hollis. Let me show you what was crazy. Show you what was crazy. From that day, he's been called Hollis. When I go to his house, his wife calls him Jeremy. God says sometimes I have to come myself because I know not just who you are, not just who you're becoming, but I know who you were. So when I show up, I show up as who was, who is, and is to come. So when I show up, I am fixing your past, your present, and your future all at the same time. It's called a total and, and a theophanic experience. So, so is this God or is this Jesus? I don't know. Is it God or is it Jesus? I don't know. Is it God or is it Jesus? I don't know. But what you gonna do? I really don't care which one of them was. Because if it's God, he's able to do exceeding and abundantly. If it's Jesus, all power is in his hands. So whichever one show up, I'm... This is why grandmama said, anyway, you black. I'm going to give you 30 seconds. I need you to praise God like God just showed up. I need you to shout like it's already better. I need you to shout. Like he's already working it out. I need you to shout. Woo. Leslie, put the scripture on the screen. Angel of the Lord appears. All right. Angel of the Lord. I say, sorry, watch this. Angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, watch this. Mighty hero, the Lord is with you. Leslie, do you have verse 13? Do you have verse 13? I really want them to see this. Verse 13, because it's cold-blooded, because in verse 13, he says, Gideon says, Sir, <laughs> if this Lord is with us, why has all this happened? Now, I'm, I'm preaching in reverse. I need y'all to flow with me, okay? Because the first response to a foreign voice is not foreign. That's weird. Okay, I got to say it better. His first response to a foreign verse, shucks, okay. His first response to a foreign voice is familiarity. Okay, I'll help you. If you in your closet finding shoes and a voice you don't know, say entrepreneur, start the business. You missed your shout. If, if, you at, if you at your nine to five and you hear a voice that says another degree or educated one, the Lord is with you. First thing you're going to say is, who is that? Can I ask you a question? How Gideon understand the voice and the disciples didn't understand the image? Jesus shows up on the boat and they say, is that a ghost? He says, oh, valiant warrior. 
And the first word out Gideon's mouth is, sir, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? What trips me out is, it's not until I believe verse 15, he feels he's not qualified. The first thing Gideon addresses is not who he's going to be. It's his past. He says, oh, valiant warrior. Now, here's what's cold-blooded about that. The term, oh, valiant warrior in Hebrew literally translates to mean to chase directly into the face of the enemy. How? Sway how? How you going to call somebody who hiding from the enemy or one who looking for the enemy? Because God will call you what you have not yet become because he sees everything in you that you can't do me a favor I know you don't want to talk to nobody but I need you to talk through your mask or without your mask look at your neighbor and say God's getting ready to change your name that's the wrong somebody look at somebody else and say he's getting ready to change your name I, I, I don't know who I'm talking to but if you want to get me excited call me something Look around you and say, call me something. I'm getting ready to do an exercise. Find somebody you trust and just call them something real quick. Millionaire, entrepreneur, governor, president, doctor, lawyer, successful, prophetess, evangelist, intercessor. I am what God said I am. Head, not the tail, above and not beneath the lender and not the borrower. I am, I am. Y'all gonna make me have church in here. I need you to take 30 seconds and praise God for everything you're getting ready to be. I'm gonna stop. Three minutes. Oh, valiant. Warrior. D, D, NASB says, look at this. NASB says, oh, valiant warrior. New King James says, mighty man of value. NRSV calls him mighty warrior. NLT calls him mighty hero. Pastor Mike, which one we gonna go with? I don't care. All of I need you to catch this. Why? He says, oh, mighty warrior. Why is this important, PMJ? He says, the Lord is with thee. Now, the Lord is with thee in Hebrew translates to mean, I'm scared to say this. I am terrified to say this, so I'm going to say it at a safe distance, okay? The Lord is with thee in Hebrew translates to mean, literally, his power is on you. Y'all missed it. Y'all missed it. Y'all missed it. Because you thought, you thought, you, you thought, you thought the Lord is with me. D, you, you thought the Lord is with me. Man, God was going to do this. Uh-huh. You mess with my brother? Do it. Do it. Do it. No, that ain't what God meant. That ain't what God meant. What God really said was, Because when you see him, when you see him, this is why your haters don't like you. This is why the devil keep bothering you. It's because every time they look at you, they see your daddy. I need you to shout that God is with me. Okay, I, thou art with me. Thou art with me. Thou art with me. Say it. Thou, yeah, yeah, me. Thou art with me. And that's our war cry. I got so much left. I'm going to stop. That's our war cry. That's our war cry. Thou 
art with me. Thou art with me. That's our war cry. That's our war cry. That does not just mean he's coming because he is. That means it's on you. And I want to prophesy that the reason Councilman Woods, he has you in office. The reason God keeps putting you back in office, Miss Marie. The reason Deanna God keeps putting you in all these special rooms is because God says, I am anointing in this season double agents. That you look like your contemporaries, but it's something different on you. This is why when you go to work, stop complaining that they won't go to lunch with you. They can't go to lunch with you. They feel something different when you're in the room. Am I preaching to anybody? Thou art with me. In my prayer. Can I be honest? Um, the devil. The devil will convince you that there's something wrong with you. He will, he will convince you that there's something wrong with you. You'll sit at home and say, well, I don't have no friends. Why every industry I get in, I got enemies. No pastor friends. And you look up and you sit there, you're like, God, is there something wrong with me? And this is for many of you who have laid down your gift. I'm not a prayer warrior no more. I'm not a prophet no more. I'm not a minister. No, no, I'm gonna just do me. I'm gonna go to church. I'm gonna do what I gotta do. And the devil is sitting there like, got him. Cause you thought you were anointed for a crowd. You are anointed for your house. If you don't walk in purpose, your house gonna crumble. And your house ain't your address. Your house is those who live under your sphere of influence. And God says, protect your house. Protect your house. He says, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to skip the rest of it. He says, I'm with you. Here's what I want you to do. Can you stand with me all over this room? Oh, God. Woo. He says, because it's so much in the scripture. It's so, I'm sorry. It, it's so much in the scripture. Because Gideon literally says, okay, if you're really God, this cold-blooded. He says, if you're really God, this is what I want you to do. I want you to do this. He says, I need you to do something. Look at verse 17. It's on the screen. Gideon replied, if you are truly going to help me, show me a sign. Uh, oh, my God. God, I'm out here. If you truly going to help me. Show me a sign. Show me a sign. Prove that it is really the Lord speaking to me. This is why I still can't figure out why many of us struggle with giving. It is one of the only places in the Bible where God says, dare me. Try me now and see. See if I won't open the windows of heaven. Pour you out a blessing. Look at what he says right here. Don't go away. I want y'all got to catch this. Uh, do me a favor, Arkel, if you can, I need you to put that scripture on the screen if, if she's able, because I want you to see this. It's verses 17 through 18. It says, show me a sign. Watch this. To prove that it is really the Lord speaking to me. Look at verse 18. But don't go away until I come back and bring my greatest gift. Because whenever, I don't think you heard what I just said. Whenever you try to get a sign without a seed, whenever, stay with your pastor, you try to get a sign without a seed, you're being cynical. Are you really God? Prove it. No, the proof is in the sacrifice. He says, no, I want you to catch this. Can I ask you a question? Can I ask you a question? Can I ask you a question? 
what would his offering have been? Now, Pastor Darius, Pastor Leslie, Pastor Hollis, Tiffany, uh, Pastor, ja Pastor um, James, Pastor Curtis, I need y'all, if I'm wrong, I'm gonna stand here next Tuesday and correct myself. But back then, they didn't necessarily just give finances. They gave crops, cattle, corn. This is why corn sounds so much like coin. It was a barter system. Think about it. They would give corn, we call it coin. Did you catch that? This is why giving is like water. That's why you call money currency. Because when it's done right, cash. Because money was never meant to be stagnant. When money is stagnant like water, it... That's for 70 of y'all who ain't did nothing but still ain't got nothing. Are you trying to figure out where did it go? Because wherever you put seed, it grows. So he says, let me give my offering. So if he's, everything's being taken by the Midianites, can I just argue? What if he finna go give him, D? What he just beat? Because remember when we met him, what he was doing? The wheat press. What if he hears the voice and starts talking and says, you know what? I'll be right back. If you really God, I'm going to give you my last. Because I know what you're going to do with it, Terrell. Eyes have not seen. Ears have not heard. And what God does, he says, this is what I'm going to do. Here's the sign I want. After I sow, I'm going to put my... I just drew a blank. I'm going to put my fleece on the ground. If the ground wet and my fleece dry, that will show me it was God. Okay? Ground reprimands the to me i gotta break it down because so many times we don't see ourselves enough in the text so you'll leave her everybody feeling like you're giddy and god called me yes but you are also the fleece yep you don't believe me the devil rose up on god and says prove it god if if if, if, if job really is who he says he is put him in something and see if he looked like what he in that's what that is. Put, I'm going to put my towel on the ground. Make the ground wet, but make my towel dry. Or in other words, I'm going to put you in something. Yeah. Let's see if you come out looking like what I called you. Wow. And sadly, many of us were put in jobs, atmospheres, circles, offices, places, and we failed to remain. He put a dry towel on the ground and said it has the integrity to remain dry. Even though everything around it wet. Can I ask you a question? You don't have to change circles if you so solid in who you are. I can't go around them no more. I understand that principle. I think you should change playmates and playgrounds. But at a certain point, if you can't go nowhere, that is indicative that you're not as strong as you think you are. I had to perform in a nightclub. They invite me to Georgia. The, the event get rained out. The owner has a club. I walk into the club. There's liquor shots, Jack and Coke, Hennessy, cigarettes, We all of this going on. Me, uh, Rod, Rod, Terrell, well, Terrell uh, Steve, uh, Wateria, Amanda, we behind the scenes like, oh my God. Everybody who go up before us rapping, singing. I come up, I got it, I got it. By the time we leave, cup in one hand, tears on face, cigarette in this hand, hands lifted. And we got to the back and was like, that's why God wanted, we came out dry. You are the light. That's why I got to put you in the dark. Chaz, can you do me a favor? Can you black out the sanctuary if you don't mind, Chaz? 
I need you to do that. Can you black out the sanctuary, please? Uh, especially the stage lights, uh, if you don't mind. Because what happens is when light, sorry, when light is around light, what value does it have? You see that? This light is doing its job. That light is doing its job. And the wall is giving off a natural light. Now I want you to catch this. That light is not enough. That light is not enough. And the atmosphere ain't enough. If you ain't present. What's the use in going back to church if I'm be standing there with my one little light? What's the use in calling ourselves Rock Church if it's going to be seven of us letting the light shine? What's the use of opening the doors of the church if you not? The first lesson they taught you as a Christian, as a little child, is this little? You already knew what I was about to say. Light of mine. Thank you, Chaz. I'm. But can you raise the light, Chaz? But when you come apart, and you become a part, and you become a part, now we're in purpose. God tells Gideon, and we're going home. He says, go get your army. But then he tells them, you have too many. How many does he start out with? 30,000. I believe it's 30,000. 30,000. And what happens is 32,000, I think, start out with them. 22,000 people leave. Why, Pastor Mike? He says, everybody who's scared, send them home. Now, that's relative. This is where I've grown. I'm so proud of me. I'm going to say that. Here's where I've grown. Curtis, early in my ministry, I would have said this, Hollis. I would have said, and the text says, everybody who's scared, leave. I ain't scared of no COVID. I ain't scared of no so-and-so. If you're scared, get out. And, and I would have got a reaction in the moment. That's ignorance. I'm educated. See, 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 fear, they taught me in, in high school, false evidence appearing real. But fear is also a spirit. God does not have a problem with us being conscious and concerned. He has a problem with us being overtaken and overwhelmed. Jesus. See, see, when the 12 spies go to the, the promised land, 10 of them were overwhelmed. Two of them were concerned but still have faith. Yeah, no, 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 no. It's some giants in the land, but we trust God. And I want to speak by faith. Somebody say fear. fear. I want you to say it like you mean it. Say fear. fear. I want to read this to you. I want to read this to you. And, and, and if you need faith, I want you to put this on your faith. All right. Not my words. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even my enemies and my foes, came up upon me to eat of my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Though an host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this will I be confident. One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell. When problems arise, he says, just get me in his house. Dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me up upon a rock and now shall my head be lifted above my enemies round about me therefore I will offer in his temple sacrifices of joy I will sing yeah I will sing praise unto the Lord 2 Timothy 1 and 7 says for God has not given us a spirit of fear but of power and of love and of a sound mind are you ready to rock I want to pray and I need you to pray wherever you are at home in this room I need you to pray in the name of Jesus, I refuse to fear because God has not given me the spirit of fear, 
but of power and of love and a sound mind. I bind the spirit of fear in my life. I need you to say that. I bind the spirit of fear in my life in the name of Jesus. I break every evil covenant that has brought fear into my life in the name of Jesus. I command every terror of the night that has brought fear into my life to stop and move from my environment in the name of Jesus. You spirit of fear, loose your hold upon our people. You spirit of fear, loose the hold over my family and my life. In the name of Jesus, I command all human agents using the spirit of fear to terrify us in the night to stumble and fall in the name of Jesus. The fear and terror of unbelievers shall not be my lot. The fear that this world lives under will not be my portion. In the name of Jesus, my tomorrow is blessed. <laughs> in Jesus' name. I said my tomorrow is blessed. In Jesus' name. Therefore, your spirit that is responsible for fear of tomorrow in my life, I bind you in the name of Jesus. My destiny is attached to God. Therefore, I decree that I can never fail. In Jesus' name. Every bondage that I am subjecting myself to by the spirit of fear, I break you in the name of Jesus. All negative doors that the spirit of fear has opened in my past be closed now in the name of Jesus. Every disease, oppression, depression that came into my life as a result of fear disappear now in the name of Jesus. I refuse to be intimidated by any demon dem demonic nightmare in the name of Ah, oh, I speak every enchantment, invocation of fear being made against me. I neutralize you and I command you to fail in the mighty name of Jesus. Every confederacy of the enemies in my home with the enemies outside my home shall not stand in the name of Jesus. All arrangements of the devil concerning my home shall not stand neither shall they come to pass in the name of Jesus I destroy all efforts of the enemy to frustrate my work in the name of Jesus I nullify every writing agreement covenant and contract against my work in the name of Jesus Father Lord Increase my greatness. Comfort us on every side. In the name of Jesus. Oh Lord, as you delight in my prosperity, I pray that you bless me indeed in our work. Let no household enemy be able to control their well-being any longer. In Jesus' name. And the church said, I need you to celebrate like it's already done. Hear me, going home. God has called us for such a time as this. You hear me? For such a time as this. Know that you know, that you know, because waiting on affirmation from the uncalled will never come. Accusation comes to detour your affirmation. I'm going, what's an accusation? An attack. If I can accuse you of what, of something so much so that you feel unworthy of the affirmation, you abort the assignment. You've been called for such a time as this. And Father, I stretch my hands over them now. And I ask that you cover them physically, cover them spiritually, financially, emotionally, mentally. God, give them the desires of their heart. 
God, we don't have all the answers. God, I wish I was as bold as I look. I wish I was as fearless as I look. But God, even now my heart is concerned with my people. The news implants so much fear sometimes that I don't even know what's real. God, communities are sometimes so overwhelmed with fear that we have now bought into fear in such a way that to go around other black people feels scary. Yet stadiums can be filled in rejoicing. But whenever we decide to come together, there has to be a spirit of concern. God, I ask right now that you take away the spirit of fear. I ask that you continue to grow us in the things of God. I ask that we turn our hearts back to God. God, I pray people don't miss me. I pray people don't miss church. They miss the experience, the presence of God. That when I went to that building, I felt God. That I may not have had it all together, but when I was in that room, I felt better. When I was in that room, I felt stronger. When I was in that room, I felt like I could go on. So God, in this moment, I am not asking them to run back to a service to hear me. They can hear me from home. They never stop hearing me. They never stop hearing worship. But what we did miss is your presence. Because God, if I'm being honest, even as the pastor of this church, it didn't feel right in this room by myself. Because God, the presence of God was invoked by all of our hearts being in one place on one accord. And it's for that reason, God, we ask that you grace us for this assignment. It is in Jesus' name we pray. And everyone say it. All right, y'all ready to go clap your hands? I love you. All right, so I wanna say this to you. If you're watching at home or if you're in the room, I want you to know that, man, I really believe God is calling us for such, come, come here, JT. I believe God is calling us, somebody help him, for such a time as this. I wanna, want you to do me a favor if you don't mind. Right there, I want them to see me with my folk. I want you to see Zoom all the way out. God is calling us for such a time as this. We are here and we firmly believe that God is calling us back to in-person worship the first Sunday in January. And it's so tantamount. I believe this. I personally cannot start another year outside of God's house. That's me. I cannot start another year not in his presence. And it's my heart's desire that that first Sunday that you come feel, F-E-E-L, feel, somebody say feel. feel, feel the room. I mean, it's from the bottom of my heart. I really feel God. Uh, the greatest gift is right there on your screen. We're coming together to give our end, year end offering. It is our sacrificial offering. I want to make this very clear. There is no pressure from your pastor for that. That is a free will offering. I'm just free enough to know if I get free, he will. You miss what I just said. It's a free will offering. But if I get free enough, he will open the windows of heaven and proud of blessing. I don't have room enough to re. See, I mean this from the depths of my heart. Today, I talk with Coach, I call him JoJo, over at the Central Park Chargers, and they're in Florida, I believe, right now, uh, competing, and each day as they win, they get to stay. And I've been telling how y'all doing? We won. I said, how many more days y'all got? We're going to be here all week. We're trying to figure it out. I was blessed. I was able to send them $1,000 personally, and it felt so good to be able to give back to the same organization that I played for in the eighth, when I was eight and nine years old. And all those little kids, and that's the ones you see right there on the screen, that's them right there that we were able to bless. And I mean this, that wasn't a church blessing. That was a Pastor Mike blessing. Why? Because to me, my giving does not just stop in the sanctuary. I want my light to shine everywhere we go. And I truly believe that's what God is calling us to do, that we can do exceeding and abundant above all. We could ever ask, think, dream, or imagine when we get on one accord, not just about our worship, but our giving and our efforts. Hear me when I say this. I was tripping because the picture you see on the screen now, that is the inauguration. I want to show you what's cold-blooded. The judge right there holding the Bible, that's a rock city. That's a rock citizen right there. In the corner of that picture, that's a councilman. That's a rock city season. That handsome brother you see praying right there, that's me. That's a rock city season. That pit, that's a rock city season. God is putting us in a position, I mean this, where God is putting people who are part of our church family from Capitol Hill 
all the way down to Hilton Hills. I'm telling you, he's doing some things that eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, and I firmly believe this is the season. You, I, come here, I'm talking to you. Wait, I'm talking to you. It is time for you to get up. Hear me when I see this. Gideon is at the bottom doing the work of the top. Here's the part that I left out. It's possible to be doing the work and still be missing. That's for every person in this room and abroad who's ushering because it's safe, but you were really called to be praying for people. When you get to heaven, he's not going to care if you were busy. He's going to care if you were in purpose. And we can't just be busy. You're called to do more than just sing in the background. You're called to do more than just play on a keyboard. I am called to do more than just preach. This is why the things I do during the week, sometimes you'll never hear about. That's part of my secondary calling. I firmly believe God is calling us for such a time as now. First Sunday in January, it is going down. I'm going to say it again. First Sunday in January, it's going down at the historic Boutwell Auditorium. Hear me. I want to go ahead and prophesy over the next 21 days, starting December 12th, we're starting 21 days of prayer. Let me show you how God set stuff up. I couldn't have planned this. December 12th is 21 days to January 2nd. That is 12, 12, 1, 2. Look at that right there. I know some of my sisters talking about 11, 11. Forget 11, 11. This 12, 12 right here. 12 is the number of government. Two is the number of witness and agreement. What God is saying over this next 21 days, we are praying. We're coming into agreement with prayer. We're going to send out a prayer agenda that you'll be able to see each day what we're praying for. I'll be fasting some if you want to take that journey with your pastor because this fight, this journey is also spiritual. I am excited about that. But I also want to prophesy over the next 21 days, expect the news to get worse. I see that happening. Start expecting certain things. Start expecting accounts to get hacked. I believe that's coming in 2022. Start expecting rumors and more rumors of wars and, 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 and intelligence that's being dispersed that is now causing fear. What the enemy is trying to do is attack our faith and we have to stand that on Christ the solid rock we stand and it is for that that I am calling all of us. It's time to gear up, change clothes. It's time to put on the full armor of God so we can be who God called us to be. I love you so much. I'm praying for you. If you're giving, you know how to give. Do that. In the meantime, I will see you on Devo Energy. I am excited about what God is doing. Lift your hands right where you are at home and in this room. Repeat after me. Say, Lord, Lord your, will, your will, nothing more, nothing, more, nothing, less, nothing less, nothing else. Nothing it's in Jesus' name. We are Rock City. We'll see you. God bless you. Clap your hands, church. All right, guys, man, I prayed that word bless you. Of course, I'm sorry we have to cut it off at a certain point. Some of the things we're saying is uh, it's for the house. Uh, it's for those in the rooms. I really want them on a different wavelength spiritually. But all roads lead to the Bowell Auditorium, Birmingham, Alabama, the first Sunday in January. I am called. If you got any honor for me and you've been rocking with me in the pandemic, get your plane ticket. I want you in the room. First Sunday's rock. Come Feel the room, not F-I-L-L, -L, F E E L. Anybody can fill a room with a concert, with giveaways. But when the presence of God, when the body of Christ gets in one place on one accord, I believe something special is gonna happen. We're coming forward to church and I cannot wait to see you. Greatest gift offering is coming up. That's the date right there. I want you to pray about what your sacrificial offering will be. If you're believing God for anything, if you feel like Pastor Mike, I am on the doorstep of something special, so a seed. I believe it will come back good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over. So I love you guys. I'm praying for you. Thank you for allowing us to be a blessing to so many families. As I told you earlier, thank you for allowing me the precious privilege of being your pastor and having a music career and being a daddy and a husband. I want to say thank you for that. And let's continue to go to another level in God. Rock City, let's keep doing it big. I, hey, I almost forgot. Christmas morning on my 68th, 
Christmas morning on my 68, I'm doing something called the McClure Family Christmas Special right there on my 68 at 12 noon. I want you to join in, okay? Is it 12 noon? 12 to 11, from 11 to a.m. to 12 noon. I want you to join, all right? I, you'll hear more about it. I love you. I'm overwhelmed. We'll go. God bless you.